good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. It looks like we have a full house. Um, Mark, I have to tell you that living on orbit, you live Newton's laws. So when he was talking about a body in motion tends to stay in motion until it's acted on by an equal and opposite force, usually on the space station, that's when you run into a wall or something because you push off from one wall and you're just going straight in that direction until you hit something else. And that's, like I said, usually another wall. So Newton's, you live Newton's laws when you're in space. You internalize them. So you really, really begin to understand them very, very well. So what I'd like to do today is take a few minutes um, to talk to you about life on the space station. And I'm gonna go through it pretty quick because what I really like to do, especially with so many young people in the room, is answer questions that you have for me because I suspect a lot of you already have some questions and I really enjoy doing that. Um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about my background as we go in, into the discussion. So I was about uh, 11 years old when I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. I grew up in a very small town in Southern Illinois and I really didn't know how I might go about being an astronaut, but I know that I liked math, and I was really, really curious about how the world worked. I was always asking my parents the question why. Why does this work this way? Why does this work that way? And so I ended up deciding to go ahead and study physics. Because when I was that age, I didn't know engineering existed as a field. So of course, it's difficult to choose something that you don't know. So first of all, I'm very excited that you're all here today to get some exposure to what kind of fields are out there and what kind of things uh, intrigue you and make you curious so that you have some ideas of what you might want to do. But I defaulted into physics. And then I got to college and I discovered engineering. I thought, wow, this is kind of cool. You can take the physics and do something with it. And I ended up doing an electrical engineering master's after that. And then I went to work at, at, at an airplane company and was working on building airplanes. And I discovered the field of material science, which I didn't know existed until that point. And then I went and got my PhD in material science. And then I applied to NASA. So my point is, you, you know, explore what is, no matter how old you are, explore the world around you because you never know when you're going to find something that really sparks your interest. And when you find that thing that sparks your interest, you owe it to yourself to go and explore it. And so in my, in my trajectory, I happen to be all these different kinds of STEM fields, and I really love them because it helps you understand how the world works. But there's all kinds of other things out there to explore. When I joined the astronaut office, they taught me photography. And I thought, wow, this is kind of cool, too. I had to learn the Russian language. I found out I liked languages. You know, all kinds of interesting things that are out there for you to learn. So I encourage you to explore and really, really use your curiosity. So let me, let me talk about the space station real quick. I spent four and a half months on the space station during my second mission. And it, was, it looked just about like this. And a lot of people ask, well, weren't you claustrophobic? in living in such a small space for so long. And first, let me just explain that the space station is actually very large. From here to here, across the truss that's hold the sol that holds the solar rays, it's about the length of a football field. So first of all, it's very wide. And of course, we live in these cylinder mod modules that are hanging off the, the center. And from end to end, those, cylinder, those cylinders are about the length of a football field as well. They're just a little bit shorter. And so the space station is huge. And the whole arc of my career at NASA, I was at NASA from 1996 to 2012, really the whole arc of my career was about building the space station. We, we launched pieces from Russia, we launched pieces in the shuttle from the US, and we put the station together piece by piece over about 15 years like a big tinker toy. And um, there's been people living on the space station since November of 2000, and usually it's a mixture of people from the US, Russia, Europe, Japan, and Canada. So it really is an international project. And we've been working together with 16 different countries for over two decades, about 25 years now, on this project. So it's a really wonderful project. So if you go to the first slide. So there's a lot of different things that we do. You know, I launched on the shuttle, and I can talk about the shuttle launch uh, when we go to the questions and answers. I launched on the shuttle, and the days are very, they're very um, busy. And on any given day, we do a lot of different things. Of course, we have maintenance always that we are, we're doing. Just like you have to maintain your home, we have to maintain the station. We have, you can see it's a pretty big volume. This is an airlock that the Japanese built into their module. We have these white bags that we use to hold stuff in. But occasionally, we have to work on the oxygen system or the carbon dioxide removal system, or we have to work on the spacesuits, or we have to work on the um, 
the computers or we have to work on the thermal control system. So I'm a little, I learned, you know, elect, I'm an electrician and a mechanic and a plumber and just a generic jack of all trades, which is what we do to train. I trained for three and a half years before I went up, went up to the space station. But on any given day, we might have to do maintenance. Um, the ground will send us up procedures. They're like a checklist that we go through that step by step tells us what we have to do. It's kind of like an instruction book. And then there are people in mission control who can help answer our questions if we have any questions as we're doing the task of the day. So part of our job up there is maintenance. Next slide, please. Um, we have to exercise every day for two hours because if you're in space for more than 14 days, what happens is you're your uh, muscles start to atrophy and you start to lose calcium and things out of your uh, other minerals out of your bones. But you can completely halt that with exercise. And so when I lived there for four and a half months, I exercised two, and a half, or two hours a day. And when I came home, I had zero bone and muscle loss. And so it works really well. And I actually like to exercise. It's the way I relieve my stress. And so it was, um, it was actually a good deal for me. We have a treadmill. You can see right here on the center screen. You wear a harness, and it's got two very, very strong bungee cords that are attached to the treadmill. So as you run, the bungees hold you down to the treadmill. And that <clears throat> is good for pounding. It's, it's good dynamic loading on your bones, just like when you walk. You know, you're, you're loading your bones when you walk, because you, every time you hit the hit the ground with your foot, you're putting a, an impulse up through your leg. And so the, the running on the treadmill gives you that dynamic loading. We have a bicycle ergometer. You strap yourself down to the bicycle, and you can pedal really fast and get your heart rate up. And so I'd pedal really fast for two minutes, and then I'd rest for a minute, and I'd pedal really fast for two minutes, and I'd rest for a minute. And that allowed me to work my heart out, my cardiovascular system, because your heart's a muscle, right? And you need to, you need to make sure it stays um, healthy. And then finally, we have this resistive exercise device that we installed during my mission. And what that does is it simulates weightlifting. So there's two vacuum cylinders, and you pull a vacuum on those cylinders, which creates a loading situation. You can do things like squats and shoulder presses and bench presses and all these kinds of things that you do when you lift weights. And that does static loading. So that helps you just kind of work out your muscles and put some load on your bones for static loading. And so on any given day, I would either run on the treadmill or do the bicycle ergometer, and then I would do uh, an hour on the resistive exercise device. And like I said, with that, I came back strong. I was able to stand up when I came home, and I felt really strong. However, Coming back into gravity messed with my balance a lot. And, we, and I can talk a little bit more about that in the questions. But it was really, you know, I, I, my head, there's um, fluid in your inner ear that uses gravity to tell your brain, you know, what attitude you're at. And so when I came back, I did not want to move my head around really fast. If I wanted to look in this direction, I very, very slowly turned my whole upper body. Because if I would have moved my head really fast, I probably would have fell over because I felt a little bit dizzy. And that lasted for, for a few days, actually. Next slide. Food, a lot of people ask about food, so I'll just talk about this um, right off the bat. We have dehydrated food, and we have food that's kind of like meals ready to eat that comes in pouches or cans. And so you can heat up the dehydrated food with cold water or hot water and put it into the, the convection oven or, or conduction oven, or you can um, put the meals ready to eat in either the pouch or the can in a, in a little oven to warm them up as well. So some of the food is good, and some of the food is not so good. Uh, what I really enjoyed was the spinach and the, the cream sauce. I enjoyed the soups were all very good. I enjoyed the, the blueberry cherry cobbler and the chocolate pudding cake. That was really good. The shrimp cocktail, believe it or not, shrimp cocktail actually rehydrates really nicely. Um, the strawberries rehydrate. If you give them a couple of hours, they start kind of cardboardy, but you got to let them sit in the water for a couple hours, and they're actually pretty good. Um, we get fresh food when the cargo vehicles come up, and it's really, really nice to open up the cargo hatch and smell fresh citrus, like lemons and oranges and, and, and things like that. It just smells so, so good. Uh, they also send up apples and onions and occasionally a, a tomato. They don't really travel well to space, though. The tomatoes don't. Some of the meats, it was a little bit harder to, to rehydrate um, like the meats. And some of the meals ready to eat meats didn't taste that good. I'm not a big meat eater, and so I didn't really mind not having good meats because I didn't tend to eat that much. But like meatloaf, not so good. Teriyaki chicken, not so good. So um, it, was, it was the food was OK. You know what I missed, though? I missed crunchy and fresh. 
Because what happens in space is without gravity, something called surface tension takes over. So that means anything with a liquid in it will, will kind of stick to your hand or stick to the spoon. So anything with a liquid in it, I could dip my spoon into it and the surface tension holds the food to my spoon and I could very carefully bring it to my mouth and then uh, eat it without making a mess. But stuff that's dry, like if you opened a bag of potato chips in space, you know what would happen? Poof, all the potato chips would, run, would just float out and, and run around. And that could actually be dangerous because potato chips are sharp, right? You can get those in your eye, you can really hurt yourself. Because what happens on Earth, of course, you open, you open a bag of potato chips and if you drop some, they, you know, gravity pulls them to the ground and it's not, so, it's not so bad. So we don't have a lot of crunchy stuff crunchy types of food. So whenever I came home, I always had a green salad and a chocolate milkshake and a piece of cheese pizza because I usually missed melted cheese as well. So that was always my welcome back to earth uh, food. But the food wasn't too bad. Next slide. Sleeping. Let's talk a little bit about sleeping because that's another popular question. So sleeping is one of the hardest things that people get have to adapt to when you go into space. On the shuttle when we launch, we have sleeping bags and so every day at the end of the day we would unroll our sleeping bags and we attach them to the wall or we attach them to the ceiling or wherever and then we're kind of floating there in our sleeping bags and your arms naturally want to do this so you kind of sleep like this because they're just floating in front of you, right? And then um, at the end of the day we have to put our sleeping bags away because that's our workspace as well. On Space Station, we had a small little uh, crew quarter, which is probably about the size of this podium in volume. And I had my sleeping bag uh, bungee corded to the wall. And it was really comfortable to strap myself into my sleeping bag and feel that bungee cord holding me against the wall. And I could fall asleep pretty comfortably. And also in my crew quarter, I had a computer and I had a few things from home and my clothes. But um, once you live up in, uh, in space for a while, you really adapt to sleeping and you kind of get used to it and it feels really comfortable. But for people who go on a shuttle mission and they're only there for 10 or 12 days, it's a little bit hard for them to adjust. But it's funny because once your body gets used to it, it remembers the environment. So I had a short mission and then I had a long mission and then my last mission was also a short mission. So I went up on my last mission. I was with uh, three guys who had only been on short duration missions. And we got up there and the first night, I fell asleep immediately because immediately, my body remembered. After spending four and a half months in space, my body remembered and said, oh yeah, I know this environment. I'm comfortable. I'm just going to fall asleep. Where the three guys I was with, they really had trouble falling asleep because they hadn't had the experience that I had in space. So every time I went up, up to space and came back, my body remembered the environment. But you can see a picture here of me in the sleep station uh, with my sleeping bag against the wall and so it was like my private little bedroom and it was really nice to have that private spot when you're up there for a long time and of course without gravity right it, there's no up or down or sideways and so we have crew quarters that are kind of around in a little circle and these guys are all sticking their heads out of their crew quarters so it doesn't matter if you're sleeping on the ceiling or the wall or the floor right because there's no such thing as a ceiling or a wall or a floor without gravity because that's what defines it here for us on earth uh, next slide please Relaxing. Um, so we do get a chance to relax. You know, well, we're not doing maintenance or we're not doing spacewalks or we're not doing robotics. We're doing tons and tons of different kinds of uh, science experiments. Let me just spend a moment to talk about those. The reason why we're up on the space station is that it's a laboratory in zero gravity and microgravity. And so there's things that happen that there, there's scientific phenomena, there's physical phenomenon that manifest when you don't have gravity um, uh, swamping it. So for example, let's talk about liquids for a minute. If I open this jar, this bottle of water, which I guess is mine, okay, so you see the water stays in the bottle, right? Why? Because gravity is holding the water into the bottle. So I mentioned surface tension taking over when, when gravity's not swamp, you know, uh, completely dominating it, so microgravity surface tension s takes over. If we were in space and I opened this bottle, you know what would happen? The water would climb up the inside surface of the, of the plastic and come out at the top and form like a little bubble at the top. You guys have seen pictures of astronauts with uh, spheres of liquid in front of them, so a sphere is the lowest energy 
uh, shape, and that's why the water takes its surface. There's also a picture of me on the internet with a glove of water on my hand. Like I said, the, the surface tension forms the water as a glove on my hand. So liquids behave completely differently in space. Likewise, other materials and how materials form behaves differently in space. The, the biology and, and um, microbiology processes behave differently in space. Combustion behaves differently in space. We're still learning about how the human body changes in space. So all of these things, uh, all these types of scientific phenomena are the things that we're investigating on the space station, and we can do that when we're living there, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. And so we're doing a lot of very interesting science up there, and that's really what we spend most of our time doing. But we have a regular work day. Living on the space station is just like having a job, except that your home and your workplace are the same place, right? And so at the end of the day, you know, we, we're finished with our day and we have time to relax. And there's this thing called the cupola up there, which wasn't there when I was living there, but was there on my last mission. And it's this wonderful 360 degrees uh, window where you can see the earth all the way around you. And it's such a nice place to spend time and watch the earth go by. We also watch movies together. We tend to eat meals together. And Yuri and Mike and I, we were uh, up there together for four and a half months, and we usually talk to each other in English and Russian both, because we learn Russian and they learn English, and we would just kind of enjoy each other's company and spend time talking about the day, just like you do with your family at the end of the day. And then we can also make phone calls when we have the right satellite link, so we can actually call our family and friends, which was always fun to do. We have email, so we can, we can correspond over email, and on the weekends we have video conferences with our family, so there's a lot of things to do when we're relaxing in space. And then we can take pictures, you can go to the next slide. Oh, next, skip that one. Yeah, and then we can take pictures. I took 18,000 pictures when I was living in space, and that's not even the, the most, there's a lot of my colleagues who take as many as 30 or 40 or 50,000. And that's one of the, because it's one of the things that we do when we have time, and you never, ever, ever get tired of it, is look out the window and watch the Earth go by, whether it's up in the cupola or some of the windows that are just facing down towards the Earth. Because it's so amazing to see our planet from a distance, it's not really a distance, we're only 300 miles up, but to see a whole, the whole planet at one time. Because you look out the window and you see it and you recognize how fragile it is, how beautiful it is, how very special it is. And it's incredible how you learn, you, it, your perspective changes because you're just like, wow, we can't take this for granted. The Earth is our spaceship and we're all crew members on this spaceship and we have to take good care of our spaceship because it's, it's what's propelling us through this dark vacuum of space and keeping us safe. And our atmosphere looks so thin, it looks like you can just blow on it and it'll go drift away. And so you, you know, seeing the Earth from space really gives you a, a great appreciation for the planet. And when I came home, I really was anxious to come back and just go outside. You know, I had these wonderful views of the planet, I, got, I had a wonderful experience of it, but I wasn't in it. And when the hatch opened in Florida, when we landed after being on space station four and a half months, there was a fresh breeze. With the, I could smell the sea air, I could smell the, the earth, um, you know, the, the musty smell of earth, and that breeze came into the shuttle hatch, and, and I said, wow, that's, smell that breeze, that's wonderful. And all the guys who were on the shuttle with me, they'd only been gone for 10 or 12 days, so they didn't really understand how much I was appreciating that fresh breeze of Earth, and it was so nice to be able to go outside. So don't take our planet for granted. It's absolutely special, and it's absolutely fragile. But at nighttime, what was really nice as we were on the night side of the planet is you could look down and you could see where everybody lives, because all of the cities are lit up. And you can see where all the population centers are. For example, on the East Coast of the United States, from New York City all the way down to Washington, D.C., was one big monster light. It's just one huge, uh, huge, huge, densely populated area. Europe, very, very densely populated. Central Asia, not so much. And some of these photos and videos are out there on YouTube. If you type astronaut videos of Earth or astronaut photos of Earth, you can see some of this. Also, what's really interesting at nighttime is to look at thunderstorms, because you can see hundreds of miles of thunderstorms at one time, and there's so much cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning that you can see as you look out the window. It's absolutely brilliant. During the day, you really can't see evidence of people so much. Cities look like these boring, ugly smudges. But what you can see during the day is all of the amazing, beautiful nature that we have on our planet. First of all, there's tons of water. We are a water planet. Most of the time, we are over water. So you see a lot of blue and white, white from the clouds. 
you see mountain ranges. I saw a volcano erupting in Central America one day as we went over, a big, huge monster glacier down in Antarctica. The, um, the lakes, the rivers, South America has so many rivers. It, you, you, you read about the Amazon, but there's so many other, river, so many other rivers down in, in South America. The deserts of the Sahara are absolutely incredible because there's rows of sand dunes that, that look like waves on a beach. And I want to go stand next to one of them someday because they must be monstrously huge. But yet, across in the Arabian Peninsula, instead of rows of sand dunes, they have little apostrophes or little curly cues of sand dunes because the wind and the weather patterns are completely different. It's really, really amazingly beautiful. The desert of Australia and the outback, it reflects a lot of red light because of the soil. And so you could tell what part of the world we were over if we were getting reflection of orange light or red light up through the window without even looking out the window. It's like orange. Oh, we're over the Middle East. Red. Oh, we're over Australia. The Caribbean, one of my favorite places. You can look down in the Caribbean and you can see the Caribbean at one time. And it's the this huge rainbow of blues as the depth of the water changes and you come up to the shallows around the islands. And the, inside those rainbows of blues are channels cut into the, you can see where the channels are cut through the sand because the, the water is so shallow in some areas. So it looks like one, a, a beautiful blue palette of mother nature's modern art. It's absolutely amazing. Our planet is so, so beautiful. And again, you can see some of these videos out on YouTube that some of the crew took with, when they had uh, cameras up there better than, than mine. So I think what I'm gonna do is stop there because uh, we got a little bit of a late start. I wanna make sure we have at least 25 minutes for questions. So what I'd like to do now, and let's see, where's Ed? Right you know, here. Ed's got the microphone, so he's gonna run around, and when you raise your hand, he'll come to you, and make sure you try and circulate around the whole room. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get all the so way around, uh, kids only. You know, so you got- you, you, <laughs> The adults, that high, was high school or younger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, we'll st we'll, but, we're going to start in the front, but make your questions short so everybody gets a chance to ask. Did she have a friend in space? I'm sorry. Did you I, have a friend when you were up in space? Did I have a friend in space? You know, my crewmates were with me. On my first mission, I flew with uh, five other people. And on my second mission, I had two other people. And then on my third mission, I had three other people. And so I had my friends with me, yes. How do we have one gravity on Earth but zero gravity up, up right. in space? Good question. So we're in zero on. gravity in space because what happens is we're actually in free, it's called free fall. So how many of you guys have been on one of those rides where you, you, you go up and it's like a drop tower where it drops you? Remember for that moment in that drop tower, you, you feel like you're, you're, uh, your butt's leaving the seat and you're sort of floating there for a minute, That's, so you're in free fall at that moment. So when we're circling around the orbit, and when we're circling around the Earth, we're going 17,500 miles per hour. It's really fast, right? So we're going at exactly what's called orbital velocity. So as we're falling to the Earth, the Earth is falling away from us. So we're actually in perpetual free fall, and that's what creates the, the zero gravity situation, just like that moment when your butt's off your seat. We're just living in that all the time. Okay, so we're really not away from gravity, but we're just in that falling, 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 falling. And we're constantly falling to the Earth, and the Earth is constantly moving out from underneath us. So you know, to return to the planet from being on orbit, all we have to do is slow down. Because once we slow down, we're not going fast enough to stay in that free fall, and now we're gonna intersect with the Earth and we come down. So that's actually how it works. That's a really good question. Is there internet in space? Is there internet in space? There is now. There wasn't when I was up there because they had to figure out how to put the internet on the space station and make That's it right. secure so nobody could hack. Nobody okay. could hack up into the space station because that would be bad, right? But now they've got it all set up and you see people tweeting from space and sending pictures down. So now they have it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'll put in a plug for you at astro underscore Sandy. Is, oh, is, my, is your Twitter, Twitter, handle, Twitter handle, that's right. Which yeah. I've been following for a couple of years. Oh, oh, look at that. Did your ears pop in space because of the altitude? Did my ears pop in space? Good question. I love, you guys always have such good questions. My ears did not pop because we actually pressurized the space station to the same pressure that we have here in this room. So we stuffed the same amount of air in the space station as you have right here with you. It's not like on an airplane, you know, when you go on an airplane, they actually make the pressure in the cabin much less, so they don't have quite as much air in there, and that's why your ears pop, but we have the same amount of air. It's the same density of air. 
Do you take bath? Ah, good question. Do we take a bath? So let's talk about that for a minute. So let's Welcome pretend back. this is a bathtub, right? So if we tried to make a bathtub on orbit, what would happen? You know, the, the water stays in the bathtub because gravity holds it there, right? So if we tried to make a bath in, in orbit, you know what happened? All the water would climb out of the bathtub and just disperse itself. So no, we don't, we don't take showers for the same reason, right? Because what would happen with a shower? If you turned a shower on, Right? What makes the water come down when you turn the shower on? Gravity. Exactly. So if you turn the shower on in space, there's nothing to force the water to come off of the water faucet. So it would form a big bubble and just stick to the shower head. So you know what we do in space? We take sponge baths. Right? So I had a washcloth with some soap on it. I squirted some, some water into the washcloth very carefully to make sure that the washcloth would hold the water and had a little soap on it and I just rubbed it all over my body. And that's how we stayed clean. Um, do you get as much tired in space as you do when you're in Earth? Do you get as tired in space <laughs> as you do? Actually, that's another, you guys have some good questions. No, you don't. I was not, I slept probably an hour and a half to two hours less on average than I do on Earth. And they've, they've been doing sleep studies to try to understand that. I think it's because I didn't need to use as much energy to live, because I'm using energy right here just to stand, because gravity is trying to push me down like flat as a pancake onto the Earth. And so and, and when I'm floating around all the time without having to work against gravity, I didn't need as much energy. And you know what was really interesting? When I came back after four and a half months on orbit, I was tired for about two weeks. About five or six o'clock in the, in the afternoon, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I just want to lay down. And I realized it was because my body was having to rebuild the natural energy that you use every day just to work in gravity. And it took about two weeks for my body to readjust to that. So yeah, it's a really good question, yeah. What was your favorite experience when you were in space? What was my favorite experience? Wow. You know, it's, it's a tough call because it was so amazing to look out at our planet and watch the world go by, but I have to tell you, it was really fun to float and to, and to be able to put your body anywhere where you needed it. I mean, think about what would happen if we could all float in this room. Look at all this space above us that we can't use, right? And I spent a lot of time hanging out on the ceiling while I was in space because I could, right? <laughs> I could go anywhere I wanted to, and I could do anything I wanted to with my body. Yeah. What's your advice for someone who wants to work at NASA and maybe become an astronaut? Yeah, so the most important thing is to find something that you're passionate about, right? I picked physics because A, I didn't know much about engineering, but B, physics was really, really interesting to me, and it's still my favorite degree because it explains how the world works. And I love the fact that you can use math, because math is really a language, right? Just like English is a language, what math is for, math is how we describe how the world works, right? So when you think about it, when, you have, when you're learning arithmetic and you're learning, learning the numbers, it's like learning the letters. And then when you start to do algebra, it's like learning how to put paragraphs together. And then by the time you get to physics, you're using the math to, to describe how the world works. And so I really enjoyed that. So finding that subject that you really enjoy is important. Because also when you're doing something that you really enjoy, you're going you're gonna to do it well. And then um, get, so get a degree in a technical field. And it's probably good to get a master's. And then look for people to help you. Here's the thing. I was very shy when I was younger. And I was really kind of like, wow, can I really be an astronaut? Why do we think I can really be an astronaut? And I really didn't talk about it that much until I got to college and beyond. But I've since discovered that there are so many people out there who want to help you if you ask them questions. So look for mentors to help guide you as you develop your interests. Always, always, always ask the people around you to help you and ask for questions. Because we, we want to help you. Pe Adults want to help you guys succeed. We want to help you do everything that you want to do. So ask questions. How long did it take to get to space? Oh, good question. So the space station is about 300 miles above our head. So if you can imagine getting in your car and tying a string to your car and driving yeah. from here to, say, I don't know, Richmond or Norfolk or somewhere down there, 
that's about how far away the space station is, so it's really not that far. Gotcha. So when we launch on the space shuttle, we, we, we go from Florida, we go to 100 miles up, and that's our first orbit. So it only takes eight and a half minutes to get into our first orbit. So we go from zero to 17,500 miles per hour at eight and a half minutes, and then we'll circle at 100 miles for a little while, and then we slowly raise our orbit to go to 300 miles to get to the space station. And we take about a day and a half to get there, although if you went there directly, it would probably only take a few hours, but it takes less energy to go slowly. On, in contrast, to go to the moon, it would take about three days, and to go to Mars, it would take about six months. So the space station really is in our backyard. Yeah. How did the restroom work in space? Ah, I was waiting for this question. Everybody asks this question, no matter what the, uh, what the audience age is. So let's talk about gravity again, right? So everybody picture your toilet at home. There's water in the toilet, right? The water is staying there because gravity is holding it there, right? When you make a deposit in the toilet, your deposit stays there too because of gravity, right? So we know right away an earth toilet cannot work in space. So you have to think about what kind of a toilet can you design to work in gravity that, that when you make a deposit into the toilet, everything stays there because otherwise it would get really messy. And so it turns out that a vacuum cleaner is a good idea for how to approach a, a space toilet, and that's indeed how they work. There's a funnel with a hose connected to a tank. And so when you're ready to urinate, you turn on the switch, and you start an airflow through the funnel. And then you can urinate into the funnel, and the airflow catches the liquid, and the liquid flows through the hose and goes into the tank, where the air is um, separated from it. OK, so to go number two, there's a, there's a small little hole, it's about this big, and there's a pouch in there. And you have to kind of place yourself over the hole very carefully. You turn on a switch, it starts an airflow through the hole, and the pouch has little, hole, little micro holes through it, so the airflow goes through. And so as you make the deposit, it goes into that pouch. Here's the key point. Don't turn off the switch until you've closed the drawstring on the pouch. <laughs> because things will come out and float away. <laughs> but luckily, it works really well. And so what you do is you close the drawstring on the pouch, and then you push that down into a can. And that gets trashed. But the urine we actually recycle on orbit as a part, you know, we're trying to understand how to create a, a closed life support environment so we recycle the urine and make drinkable water out of it. But that's how the toilet works. So do you drink any liquid there? Do we drink any liquid? Yes, we do. We have drink bags. So if you imagine the pouches, you can get some drinks in pouches here on the Earth. So we have these drink bags, and some of them have lemonade powder in them. Some have our tropical drink powder in them. Some of them have orange drink in them. Some of them have fruit punch powder in them. And so there's a little needle that you can poke into the bag, and you can insert water through that needle. right? And then you take the needle out, and you put a straw in. But the straw has a clip on it. Because if the straw didn't have a clip on it, what would happen? The water would come out of the straw, right? And so when we're ready to drink, we just unclip the straw, and then we suck up some fluid, and then we clip the straw back. And that's how we drink. People say the Earth is flat. Is that true? <laughs> the Earth is very definitely not flat. And I know that because I flew around it. Around and around and around. Because it only takes us 90 minutes to go around the Earth. So that means every day I saw a ton of sunsets and sunrises, right? Every 45 minutes I saw a sunset or a sunrise as we flew around the Earth. Yeah. I forgot my question. Oh, okay. I'll come okay. back for you. Did you see the sun? Yes. You know, remember, I, I, as we go around the Earth, 45 minutes, we have a sunrise or a sunset. But I have to tell you, it's really, really, really hard to look at the sun in space. It's so white and sharp and bright and painful light, because our atmosphere filters a lot of those harsh rays from the sun. And it's actually pretty, um, it's pretty warm and welcoming and gentle light here on Earth. But up in space, it's really, really bright. So it's really, really hard to look at the sun directly. But we see it all the time. Yeah. 
How do you stay on the ground? How do I? How do you stay in one place when you have to? Ah, how do we stay in one place? So we have these things called handrails, and what we can do is we can take our foot and just put our foot underneath it and use that to hold us down. So we use our feet with these like, or we have loops and we can put our feet in the loops and that will help us stay in one place. So usually we're kind of wedging our feet underneath things to stay. What is the purpose of ISS? What is the purpose of the ISS? Yep. We, ha we have the, the space station up there so that we can do science and technology development without, and without gravity so we can understand more about how things work and that means we can improve technology down here on Earth and we can also understand what we need to build to go further. So How does it feel coming out of the planet? How does it feel coming out of the planet? All right, let me describe a launch for you. So we get on the, or in the shuttle launches, we get on the orange suits and we go out to the launch pad a few hours before launch Next. and we, we sit there, we lay on our backs because we're facing up, right? Because we're gonna go up and we're just laying there for a couple hours waiting for the launch to happen. And then when they say, when they get to 10, they start the count, 10, 9, 8, 7, and 6. At T minus 6 seconds, they would light the shuttle main engines, which was a million pounds of thrust. You're still attached to the launch platform at that point because they light the main engines early because if the main engines don't work, they can shut them off and we could abort the launch. But when they light the main engines, that's still a million pounds of thrust, but it's attached. So what happens is the whole stack sways. So you feel your seat sway a little bit. And there's a rumbling noise at the back, back of the shuttle. And then at T equals zero, they light the solid rocket boosters, which were those two uh, solid rockets that were attached to the shuttle. And when they light at T equals zero, when they light the solid rocket boosters, that's another six million pounds of thrust. So now we've got seven million pounds of thrust. And so we start off the launch pad and it's shaking and noise and there's a lot of vibration. And you're trying to look at the instruments and your head's bobbing around and it's really, really loud. And that lasts for about two minutes. After two minutes, all of the fuel in the solid rocket booster boosters were, were spent and they, with a bang and a pop and a flash of light, they pop off of the shuttle and now we're just using the shuttle main engine to go to orbit. And at some point we feel about three times our weight, three times gravity through our chest. So it feels like there's a 70 pound gorilla sitting on your chest and you kind of have to talk like this because you're forcing the air out of your lungs. And that lasts for about 60 seconds or so and then we get to orbit, it's eight and a half minutes, we get to our first orbit at 100 miles and the main engine's cut off and you know what? Then you're floating in your seat because now we're in, zero, we're in microgravity and then we start working. But that's what a launch is like. How did you cook food? Ah, uh, how do you cook food? Well, we can't cook food the way you can in your kitchen, right? Because we use gravity a lot when we cook. So we have the prepackaged food and we can put hot, well, we can put hot water in the dehydrated uh, food or in the case of the strawberries and things like that, you put cold water in it and you let that rehydrate or you can put it in a small little oven that is kind of like a baby version of your oven at home and that will warm up the packages that need to be warmed up and it's pretty straightforward. How do you take notes down? How do you take notes? So we have a clipboard, right? The clipboard has some Velcro on it, so I can actually Velcro it to the Velcro on my pants, or I can Velcro it to the wall, and I use a pencil to, pencils work better than pens, actually, and I can use a pencil to write with, and then when I'm done with the pencil, I usually put the pencil in my pocket with Velcro, or I can put the pencil on the wall with Velcro. So it's pretty easy to take notes, but a pencil works much better than a pen. And now we got a question from somebody in a NASA t-shirt. Oh, awesome. Um, have you ever um, done a spacewalk or know someone who has? Well, certainly I know people who have because my colleagues have. I did not actually do a spacewalk, although I trained for us uh, doing a spacewalk. Usually with my shuttle missions, I was a robotics officer, and then during space station, we all trained for spacewalks, but nothing broke, so I didn't have to go outside. Um, working in that big suit is pretty challenging, but it's a lot of fun as well, but I never actually did one. Okay, and now from a NASA commander. Okay. How do you um, fix the space station? How do you fix the space station? How do you fix the space station? Well, if, 
if there's something broken on the outside of the space station, we have to do a spacewalk to go fix it. And what they will typically do is if there's a lot of small things broken that they aren't really urgent, they'll wait till a bunch of them, mission control will wait till a bunch of those add up because it takes a lot of effort to do a spacewalk and you don't just want to do that casually. And sometimes they'll have planned maintenance, like for example, the spacewalks that are going right now, they're, they're replacing some batteries and that's been planned for a couple of years. And so depending upon the nature of the maintenance, it might be planned or unplanned. And then on the inside, of course, we have all the tools that you have in your garage. And so we do the same kind of work that you do around your house. Did you have glasses when you went to space and did that affect anything you did? Right, so these glasses went to space with me and they are friction fit, so they're friction fit, so they stayed on. Although I took a croaky my first mission because I wasn't sure, uh, and I liked having glasses on because it was extra protection for my eyes in case something was floating around. Of course, I need them to see as well, but no, that didn't affect anything. NASA has some eyesight standards, and I I was able to to meet those standards, so it doesn't matter if you wear glasses or not. Uh, if you went on a spacewalk, how much oxygen would you have in your tank? Right, so our spacewalks are usually designed for about seven hours. And the limiting factor is actually the carbon dioxide removal filter capacity. So, you know, as you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide and that has to get cleansed out of the atmosphere. And so the spacesuit has a special filter that will take the carbon dioxide out of the air and that filter saturates before the oxygen runs out. So that's the limiting factor is the carbon dioxide removal. How did the shuttle move in space? How did the shuttle move in space? So as we got to orbit, you know, we got all that energy from zero to 17,500 miles per hour. There's a huge amount of energy that the shuttle picks up and we just keep that energy, that energy just keeps us like going round and round, back to Newton, right? Round and round and round. So we put that energy and we just keep using it. And there are also small little motors, small little engines that the shuttle has in space to allow it to maneuver, to, you know, if it, has to, if it has to go upside down or straight or, or sideways or move it. So it has got tiny little engines on orbit that'll help it do some of the fine moving. But most of the energy comes from that seven million pounds of thrust that we, that we use to get up to orbit. How long did you train for? How long did I train for? When, you're, when you join the astronaut office, you're an astronaut candidate, and you spend two years in basic training. And then for each one of my shuttle missions, it was another year of specific training for that mission. And for my space station mission, it was three and a half years of training. Although now it's down to about two and a half years. So, so quite frankly, I've been in school my whole life, right? I was in astronaut school and I was always getting, it was so fun because I was always getting to learn new things. I got to learn photography, I got to learn spacewalking, I got to learn robotics, I got to learn how, how the space shuttle works, I got to learn some, some biology and life sciences and some emergency paramedic training. So I got to learn lots of different stuff. It was really, really a lot of fun. When did you first go to space? When did I first go to space? My very first space mission was in October of 2002. And I was super excited because I've been waiting since I was 11 to go into space. And so I was 36 then. And it was really, really cool to finally get to go into space. So you said you studied electrical engineering in college. Um, how, what advice would you give to someone going into that field and how did your knowledge of electronics help you on board the ISS? Yeah, so I, I actually did my master's in electrical engineering because I discovered that uh, when I was doing physics and I, I hung out more in the electromagnetic side and quantum, I did quantum too, sorry. Um, I did electromagnetics and it was really, really valuable because the physics and the electrical engineering both gave me a solid foundation for how things work so I could troubleshoot you know, I understood about how circuits worked. I understood how they, how they should be put together. I understood how to troubleshoot them. And so it was very good for all the hands-on kind of fixing that I had to do. Yeah. Can you see the space station from Earth without a telescope? You can see the space station from Earth at night, of course, right? If you're ever interested in finding the space station, there's a website. You know, look, if you type in, Question. where is the International Space Station into Google, it'll take you to a website. And on the website, you can, it'll ask you where you are, right? And then, and then it'll tell you the next time you can see the space station pass over. It's really, really big. And it's not that far away, so it's easy to see without a telescope. 
How did you brush your teeth without water? Oh, good question. How did you brush your teeth without water? Excellent question, because it's kind of tricky. So you think about what you do when you brush your teeth, right? You put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, and you, you brush your teeth, and that creates all this stuff in your mouth that normally you spit into the sink, right? And then you wash it down the sink with water. Well, you can't do that in zero gravity, because A, we don't have a sink, right? And second of all, the sink wouldn't work even if we had one. So you have two choices. You can swallow the toothpaste stuff, or you can spit it into a towel. So I chose to swallow. So I would brush my teeth, and then I'd have all this stuff in my mouth, and I'd get my drink bag with my straw, and I'd unclip my straw, and I'd, I'd put a little bit of water in my mouth and swish it all around and swallow it. Because spitting things into a towel creates a big mess, and so that's what I would do. So I just swallowed my toothpaste for four and a half months. It was okay. Yeah. Did you wear... Um a, a diaper in the space? Ah, good question. <laughs> but it's a good question. So, so think about it. You know, I've talked about how we went out to the launch pad early before launch. We put our suits, our orange suits on that we'd wear for launch. We put those on in the, you know, before launch, probably six or seven hours before launch. And then we're wearing them for another maybe two or three hours after we get to orbit. So you're 10 hours in this orange suit. So we exactly wear diapers. And also for the spacewalk suit. When you get into that white suit to go do a spacewalk, you're in that suit for probably 10 or 11 hours. So you're also wearing a diaper when you're in that suit. It works really well. I mean, you don't have a toilet. What are you supposed to do, right? Yeah. If you're going down way too fast, would fire come on the front or would you crash? Ah, good question. When we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, we are coming down really fast. And we do get fire on the front. But there's special materials on the front of the space shuttle that they're like insulators, right? So it can get really, really hot and those materials won't burn or they won't melt or anything. And that helps dissipate the heat so that we can come back safely. But if we didn't have those special tiles, we would burn up on, in re-entry. Right? And then we would crash. And that's what happened to the Columbia shuttle. How can you charge the electronics? How do you charge your electronics? Up How there? do you charge your electronics? So our power source on the space shuttle is solar cells. So we have solar arrays that collect the heat of the sun. And then we have special materials that can take that heat from the sun and turn it into electricity. And then we can use that electricity to power our electronics, just like solar cells on your house. Um, if you, like, if you, like, um, ha did not have your space suit and you went out to the space in a rocket ship and you landed on the moon, would you, would you, would you die? Yes. <laughs> because, because if you go out into space without a spacesuit, there's no air and there's no pressure, so you would explode. That would be bad. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. What would you do if you got sick? What would we do if you lost what? If you got sick. If you got sick. So on space station, if we get sick, we actually learn some medicine um, ourselves. So we learn how to, to do first aid like a paramedic. And so if someone's really, really sick, we would treat them and try and make them stable. And then we could call the ground, because we have a lot of medical supplies on orbit, and then we could call the ground and talk to a doctor who would then have us either further treat the patient, or if it was really, really bad, we have a rescue vehicle available, and we would return to Earth and take them to a hospital. Now, this is not going to work for when we go to the moon and Mars. We're going to have to figure out how to do more elaborate medical work further away from the planet. And so we practice telemedicine and other techniques like this in order to prepare for the moon and Mars. Did asteroids come? Did asteroids come? No, I didn't see any asteroids while I was up there. How's life in Earth? I mean, I mean space. <laughs> How is life in space? Life in space is pretty fun. And what makes it so interesting is because, you know, we float all the time. Again, we can use all of the volume in the space station. But you know what? You have to keep track of your stuff really, really carefully because everybody imagine your bedroom right now. Imagine what's in your bedroom, what's sitting on your dresser, what's, where your clothes are, probably all over the floor, right? Yeah. So if you went home and your room didn't have any gravity in it, you'd open your door and all of that stuff would be floating. 
right? And so when you're living in space, you have to keep track of your stuff really well. You've got to look for Velcro or Ziploc bags, or I had to have zippers in my pockets so things didn't float out, rubber bands, bungees, anything that we, anything we can to keep things in their place because gravity's not doing that for us. Got one last question. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite planet and why? Ah, my favorite planet is Earth. Because I was able to see Earth from space, like I mentioned before. It's so, so, so beautiful. It became my favorite planet the minute I got to see that view. So All thank right. you very much. Right. Please, thank you, everybody. Uh, a big round of applause.